Now, the flow experience is obviously what all serial killers think they're going to obtain, and indeed do obtain through the murders themselves. I recently had an experience of corresponding for a couple of years with a serial killer. I can't tell you his name because he doesn't want any publicity about it. But um, he'd murdered children, and he's one of the most intelligent men I've ever come across. He knows his Dostoevsky, his Nietzsche, his Tolstoy, as well as any academic I've ever known. He says that he did these murders as what he calls an existential experiment. So when I began to correspond with him, I hoped that <clears throat> what would happen is that I would give him that extra zip, as it were, and suddenly turn him into a creative writer, give him this sort of capacity, because he obviously already had the capacity to think very well. I realized after two years' correspondence, there's not a hope of doing it. He's completely turned into himself, into a sort of narrow little me, me, me. And then you suddenly realize that the reason he committed the murders was this feeling of resentment about the society and the feeling, they don't recognize me. I want recognition. And the feeling that with the murders, he suddenly got recognition. He's world infamous. And this recognition that, in a sense, once you've done it, you're pulled down. The Bhagavad Gita says, though the man, a man be the greatest of sinners, this knowledge will carry him like a raft above his sin. Well, I can tell you that in this particular case, the Bhagavad Gita is wrong. They're so twisted and locked in themselves that there's no way of getting them out of it. Um, Maslow said that um, the peak experience is not the mystical experience. He said, you know, the mystical experience is a very unusual experience, and the peak experience is quite commonplace to anybody who's cheerful and healthy. You know, it happens to everybody. Even tasting a cup of coffee in the morning, you know, a minor peak experience. Uh, my feeling is that that, in a way, is mistaken. The peak experience is the lower end of mystical experience. And if I was to try to explain to you the difference between the two of them, it would take me literally another 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour. But um, the essential thing about it is this. Um, the mystical experience tends to be a completely absurd experience in which things get reversed. You suddenly say things like, the subjective is the objective and the objective is the subjective. Um, the universe outside is me, and I have become the universe outside, and so on. What's more, time slows down tremendously in the mystical experience, so that everything goes at a quarter its full rate. A man called um, Light invented a machine that you could stick on the head and that would stimulate the endorphins, the brain's natural opiates. I've quoted this from um, Michael Hutchison's Mega Brain. And Hutchison describes how he had been sitting in a restaurant with light in a little booth. Light was showing in the machine and had put it on his head and so on. Light said that he was able to drive 600 miles to a conference, go through the conference and drive back 600 miles with this thing on his head because it got him so hepped up. And as Hutchison uh, was talking to him, Hutchison said, um, um, Light said, what, what are you doing at the moment? And Hutchison said, oh, I'm doing some rather boring articles on, you know, um, the ch chemical biology and this kind of thing. And then he began to explain what he was doing, and he got more and more interested and more and more excited until he found, he realized he was shouting so loud that it, people in surrounding booths were looking around at them. And then he saw that light had switched on the machine. And that what had happened, so to speak, was his consciousness had unfrozen and turned into water instead of ice. Now, clearly, this can be done physiologically in this way. And enough of that, and you would suddenly go into the mystical experience. Personally, you know, I, <laughs> I believe that it can be done by knowing clearly enough that it can be done. Thank you. 
like parapsychologists. What have you done to change that? Because the parapsychologists are the person who has a different paradigm than the underdog. They are not, they're not going to get government funding for you because government will take parapsychology too deep. Okay, there's, there's no basis for it and that we are not going to. What have you done to give it to the kind of people putting that the material that the people who are doing the production of there is undoubtedly an estrangement, as you say. Um, but, you know, this estrangement, as I've said, is also disappearing slowly. A friend of mine called Dan McDougald had an awful experience of this. He was a lawyer in Georgia. His job was to persuade the, the local authorities that certain land which they intended to flood for a reservoir was very good land. And the land in a nearby valley was rotten land, which they could flood with no cost to the local farmers. And he thought this was a, such a straightforward proposition that the authorities would agree instantly. In fact, he found that, you know, they just would not listen. And it took him five years and a huge amount of money to persuade them to put the reservoir over here rather than over here. He then thought, well, what is it that's happening? Why have they got their hands over their ears? And then suddenly, he realized when he read about an experiment at Harvard in which someone had con connected a cat's oral nerve to an oscilloscope so that when you rang a bell in the cat's ear the oscilloscope needle swung over. They found that if they put a cage with white mice in front of the cat and you rang the bell in its ear the oscilloscope needle didn't move. Now it should have moved, the eardrum should have vibrated, should have gone down the nerve and down to the oscilloscope. The cat was cutting out the noise at the eardrum, it wasn't letting it in even. Then he suddenly saw that that's what these government authorities were doing. Now, he de since he was also a criminologist and was working at the Georgia State Penitentiary, he decided to apply this to the prisoners. He suddenly said, supposing psychopaths are basically people like that, that you can't get into, then surely the answer would be to somehow make them recognize what they're doing. Now, what Dan did was in fact to devise some method which involved a kind of religious teaching too. But what he would ask them is the meaning of certain words, like, you know, love, um, charity, friendship, warmth, and so on. And from their answers, devise precisely where they were in this scale of sympathy. Now, once he'd explained to them and shown them their answers and showed them the way that their answers showed what they were like inside, they began to dissolve, as it were, and open up, which is what I hope to do, with, as I say, with my criminal friend. And he realized to his amazement that these people, as soon as they could see this logically, you just see, don't you, this is the point of what I've been saying all evening, just see it logically, see the logic in this. Never, never mind meditation and, and all the rest of it, just use ordinary logic, mathematics. That's all you've got to do. And this is what Dan did with the hardcore psychopaths. And he'd soon got them teaching one another. For example, he got in prison, um, the son of the, the governor of Georgia, um, George Wallace, who was in prison for some kind of violence, and who'd um, got himself into serious trouble and, and was um, having a, um, a hate relationship with a fellow prisoner, and had decided that the only thing you could do if you were going to be macho was to kill him. So what he'd done is to steal um, a hacksaw blade and had shot this into a knife and was prepared to kill this man. He knew that this would mean that he spent the rest of his life in jail. After spending a morning um, in Dan's class, he suddenly had this feeling, my God, just like my girl who decided not to go to Oregon or Ohio. My God, how stupid. Why do I have this feeling? I've only these two choices. And so he went up to the man in the canteen in the prison and said, can I buy you a cup of coffee? And this man said, well, yes, <laughs> obviously amazed. And suddenly the whole thing just dissolved away. Now, Dan found that he could not only do this with these hardcore psychopaths, but when he taught this to them, they could teach it to other hardcore psychopaths. And he was getting something like an 85% rehabilitation rate, which proved to be permanent over five years. And at this point, the Georgia State authorities stopped the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you can explain that to me, you know, I'd be delighted. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is that why psychology gets more press than the, the, the more primitive paradigm. The, the newspapers do not give, put parapsychology on the back page. The scientists, the federal government will not fund parapsychological research in the decade of the great 
we try to introduce in a proposal for it, and it will be laughed out and laughed at and thrown in the, in the tray. And it's in terms of Eric, why is the parapsychologist the underdog in the scientific community? Well, you have to ask Charlie that. Um, he's about, he's about to, Charlie Tart, he's about to move over somewhere else and where he can do it more freely. Well, you'd have to ask Charlie, as I say, but he was saying this earlier on, that it is indeed the underdog. But on the other hand, the very fact that people like Charlie Tart exist and that they would have found it impossible to exist in the 1950s when I began working means that the change is coming about slowly. The fact that even I have been a professor at a number of universities must mean something. How is the book campaign about the great being by the Nobel Prize? Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. What do you think of the Swedish literature? Why wasn't Graham Greene given the Nobel Prize? You say. Well, I know, I thank God he wasn't. I mean, we, we've already, uh, as it were, um, underlined his importance to a great an extent. And as I say, the same kind of thing goes with Samuel Beckett. To do green justice, he was, um, I mean, when I said this to him, he was sort of perfectly nice about it. <laughs> the, the typical English public schoolboy saying, well, yes, you were right, you know, I, I do have this failing. I'm, I'm basically weak. I enjoy being beaten and flogged and so on. Um, this, this is the problem with the English public schoolboy. I mean, one answer would be to get rid of English public schools. Um, I'm, you know, you call them private schools here in America. They all, they all have this curious, uh, this curious fallacy of insignificance, the belief that they're no good. Um, as I say, Iris Murdoch wanted to send me to university. This was one of our obsessions. And uh, obviously, universities do nobody any good at all. No, no, I don't know. Austin. Oh, Austin, no, I don't know about it. Hmm. I'd be happy if you'd like to tell me about it afterwards. <laughs> I think I'll take just one more. Ramakrishna's story of the tiger who leapt into a flock of sheep and gave birth to a baby tiger in this process and later on the baby tiger grew up among the sheep and assumed that it was a sheep and bleated like a sheep and so on until another tiger attacking the flock saw the grass-eating tiger um, dragged it to the water with the tiger bleating madly and said look you're a tiger <laughs> and then smeared its mouth with blood and suddenly the tiger licked it realized it liked it and realized it was a tiger and Ramakrishna, of course, uses this as a parable of human beings with tigers, not sheep. Um, in The Outsider, what preoccupied me, basically, was a kind of philosophical question. Uh, you can summarize it by quoting a novel called The Near and the Far by an English author, L. H. Myers, who committed suicide. Myers starts this novel in the palace of um, the great mogul Akbar, and the young prince Jali and his father have traveled for days over the desert to get to this palace and this great gathering of princes. And Jali goes up to the battlements and looks out over this desert which has left him so tired. 
and there's a magnificent sunset. And Jolly suddenly thinks, what a pity that the world is full of this contradiction of the near and the far. That sunset is so beautiful in the distance. And yet if I ran downstairs and ran across the desert, I'd just get my shoes full of sand. Nothing could get that sunset any nearer. And Myers says, like Schopenhauer, that there's no possible way of reconciling the near and the far. Now this was the philosophical problem of the 19th century that caused so many suicides. This feeling that the exquisite moments of sheer happiness were completely ungraspable. Yeats said, what the world's million lips are searching for must be substantial somewhere. And yet, you know, never came any nearer to finding it. And yet, what I said in The Outsider was that they had the wrong problem in mind. What I've been trying to talk about is the right problem all evening. The reason they had the wrong problem in mind was that they didn't recognize that what was really causing the problem was their self-pity. That again and again, these 19th century outsiders got overwhelmed by the feeling that the world is against them and that they were squashed down and there was nothing they could do about it. So it was perfectly clear to me, and having always been a sort of fairly cheerful sort of person basically, I could see this very clearly, that the problem was simply self-pity. Now when my first book um, came out, it became to my amazement an overnight bestseller, both here in America and in England. It went into 16 languages in its first year. Now I'd been struggling along. My father, father was a boot and shoe worker in a small Midland town. My background had sort of been working class. I'd never gone to a university. I left school when I was 16. And so it had been a fairly hard struggle from the age of 16 to the age of 24 when my first book appeared. It was very, very hard work. And I also assumed, like Nietzsche, that when I did begin to express myself, everybody would hatchet me. You know, Nietzsche's first book, The Birth of Tragedy, was murdered by every academic critic, and it went on like that for the rest of his life. He only began to be recognized when he went insane. I got used to the idea that this would happen to me, and suddenly my first book was an overwhelming success, and I thought, God, it's untrue. You know, if you do good work, everybody recognizes it. Then, of course, within three weeks, the tide had turned, partly because The Outsider came out in the same week as a play called Look Back in Anger by John Osborne. The press quickly labeled as angry young men, and because there'd been no literary generation since the Second World War, everybody jumped on the bandwagon, and we've got non-stop publicity all over the world. And, you know, this, the angry young man thing went on and on and on. The serious critics got sick of this, understandably, and the result is that, as I say, within six weeks, there'd been this total turnaround. And when my second book appeared a year and a half later, it was hatcheted. Time magazine came out with the headline, Scrambled Egghead, saying <laughs> that all of the critics who'd hailed my first book as a masterpiece now realized it was all a mistake, and I was just a, a repeater of other men's words, that um, basically I was a plagiarist. And um, now, this was quite a, a sort of shock. A sort of, a, you know, I felt upset, miserable, irritated. But the one thing I recognized from the outside was that I must not, under any circumstances, let it make me self-pitying. So I recognized that what I'd said in The Outsider, the outsider must learn to stand alone. That he must carry on working alone, no matter how much the conditions are against him, because this is the test of what's any good about him. That in a certain sense, if you said to an outsider like Nietzsche or Van Gogh or T. Lawrence, if you'd come down from heaven in the form of a god and said to him, don't worry, look, it's okay, you'll be all right. Just keep working and, you know, you'll be famous. And in the next century, everybody will be saying how great you are. If you'd done that, you would have destroyed them. They've got to stand alone. The quality that turns them into great men is that ability to stand totally alone. Now, once I'd recognized this, I realized that I was being forced to live out my own philosophy, whether I liked it or not. <laughs> and so I moved to Cornwall, as far from London as I could get. And, you know, I've continued producing books, churning out books, still, you know, now, after nearly 40 years of it, in England, I'm still sort of regarded as, as a, a very minor figure, a sort of once, you know, the plagiarist image has not disappeared. When I was in Japan two or three years ago, where all my books are in print, 
some Japanese journalist said, oh, in England, Mr. Wilson, you must be as famous as Charles Dickens. I said, in England, nobody's ever heard of me. <laughs> but you can see why I do feel that it's absolutely essential to learn to stand totally alone. And, you know, the feeling that this is the only thing that can actually keep you going, because we human beings have such an awful tendency, once things go right for us, to sort of heave a sigh of relief, relax, and go to sleep. The most demanded of us is somehow to stay awake. You've got to learn either to stick pins in yourself. You know, Kafka said, in the battle between yourself and the world, always take the world's side. <laughs> or, or encourage the world to do it. I have a feeling that, you know, I've encouraged the world to do it. <laughs> and I'm going to have to stop now. <laughs> Thank you.